Good morning, Southside. Good morning, Southside. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to take a minute for us to get settled. We're going to sing a choir special for you in just a second. But I just want to center our minds and focus our minds on the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I want to share a verse of scripture from uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. And this is when Solomon was blessing the temple. And he had just finished praying his prayer of dedication over the temple. And the next verse says this. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped. And they gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Now usually when I ask you to sing along with us, but this morning I want to ask you to do this. I want you to focus your heart and mind on the Lord God Almighty. I want you to focus on his character, how good he is to us. And I want you to pray that the glory of the Lord would fill this place in such a way that we would all feel it tangibly. Because when the glory of the Lord falls, we'll all be changed. When the glory of the Lord falls, we're going to be like the Israelites. We're going to worship. When the glory of the Lord falls, we're going to give thanks for his goodness to us and that his love endures forever. So as we sing, I just want you to stay your heart and mind on God and just ask him to fill this place with his glory.
Amen. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, choir. Welcome to Southside, Southside Baptist, Baptist Church. Church. Good morning, church. Good morning. I changed it up a little bit for you. I am so thankful that Julie uh, reminded us of why we're here, and that is for a singular purpose, and that is to worship our great God and Savior together. Thank you for being here, and especially if you are visiting today. We are so glad to have you. Thank you for worshiping with, uh, with this church family. If you want us to know about your attendance, you can take a card from the rack in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering plate in a few minutes when the plates are passed. When you came in today, you should have picked up a, a worship guide. It looks a little bit like this. It tells you what's happening in and around the life of our church. Just some things to mention real quickly. We're already looking ahead to summer and summer camp signups, children and youth. We've got a couple of different groups meeting this week. Uh, Litton Latte, Groovy Grands. We've got archery starting back up for the kids. And um, I can't even, this must be the, the 11th or 12th year that we've done archery. And can, it's 11th year, continues to be very popular, uh, both uh, among our folks and in the community. Let me mention one more thing before I, uh, actually two more things before I turn things over to Julie for one second. Uh, next Sunday, and you see the article in your worship guide, we are voting on some changes to our Constitution and Bylaws and our Ministry Placement Team report. You can access these things through our church website. They've been on there since last Wednesday. If you want to read through it line by line, if you have questions, thoughts, proposed amendments, please be in touch with me or uh, one of the team members this week. We'd love to hear from you before next week. Uh, we only do this, this is the first time in 10 years. Uh, that we have made uh, some changes and um, so an important vote but that'll be next week right after church uh, pickleball pickleball is a thing at Southside Baptist Church we've had a number of folks playing on Friday mornings for a while at nine o'clock and uh, now on Sunday afternoons we've got some folks who are gathering to play today the gym will be open from 2 to 4 30 to play pickleball and we're trying to kind of gauge the interest to see what we need to do with this sport. Uh, depending on how many people show up today and next week, we'll know um, how, how much to, to make it a formal event and schedule times or to just allow it to be an informal event that happens on a case-by-case -case basis. So just trying to see. If you want to come and play pickleball, you're welcome to be here today between 2 and 4.30 in the church gym. Uh, the Acts 1-8 team has asked uh, Julie to make an announcement, and I'm going to turn things over to her for one second. Julie. I just want to share with our church family, I have some very sad news to share with you today. One of our mission partners, uh, one of the founders of the Pearl Foundation, Daryl Henson, passed away from a very sudden and aggressive form of cancer this morning. Um, I have no doubts that when Daryl walked through the gates of heaven, he heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then he was met with so many people, either Nicaraguan or American, who were in heaven because of him today. Daryl was always bold to share his faith. Um, he and Linda started the Pearl Foundation by selling their home, selling everything they had. So he was a man after God's own heart. Um, so just join me in praying for this family as they walk through this valley. Um, and just pray for not only the people here in America who are his family, but he also has people in Nicaragua who love him dearly. So just pray for the Pearl Foundation, pray for their family, and I know you will be faithful to do that. Thank you so much. We enjoyed getting to know the Hensons, new mission partners uh, last year, and some of you took a mission trip with them. Uh, we'll be in prayer for them, and also as details uh, come forth for the uh, funeral, we'll publish those as well so you can be in attendance if you'd like. We are going to take a moment to greet each other. Do look around for someone you haven't yet spoken to. Let's stand. Let's shake a few hands.
Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Just a quick note before we start. Uh, archery goes through March 23rd. Your bulletin says that Touch a Truck is on March 23rd, but Touch a Truck will be on March 30th. Um, and that'll be reflected in all my parent emails as well, so we're, there's no confusion. Good morning, guys. How are y'all doing? I am so glad to see your faces. Who was so hot they were sweating when they came outside this morning? Was it so hot? Yeah? Y'all might have had so many layers on you were hot. <laughs> it was a little chilly, wasn't it? So you got into your car, your truck, your SUV. Is there anything on the back of your car? Do you have any bumper stickers on your car? No? Maddie, you look incredulous. You don't like bumper stickers? You like stickers? Thank you. I like stickers too. We should put, no, don't put stickers on your mom's car. Some people have stickers on their car, and it might be um, a Southside Baptist Church sticker, or it might be a parent of a terrific kid sticker. Um, there's a lot of different stickers you can have in your car. Some people have dog stickers, dog, stickers about their dogs. Some people really love their dogs. This one says, the more people I meet, the more I love my dog. That's not very nice, is it? <laughs> That's not very nice. I saw another one that said, if you can read this, I'm not impressed because most people can read. It's not very impressive. <laughs> you also have some Christian stickers, some stickers that point to Jesus. Have you ever seen one like this? It says, honk if you love Jesus. You want that sticker? Honk if you love Jesus. And you, anybody that rides by, they can honk the horn saying they love Jesus. That's pretty cool. Um, this one says, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And I think we can take the middle part out of that. God said it. That settles it. Whether you believe it or not, right? If God said it, that's it. Um, how about this? Do you follow Jesus this closely? Hmm. You're not supposed to follow cars real close, are you? And here's the last one I want to show you. This one is similar. I saw one on Justin Upple's truck yesterday, and I just not too long ago figured out what this means, but it's a G, and then a greater than symbol, and then an up, and then a down, and it means God is greater than my highs and my lows. It's another sticker that points to Jesus. Yeah, you got to think through it, don't you? <laughs> So Jesus on earth, there's a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about who he was. Like we talked about last week, Jesus claimed to be God, right? And he did miracles, which made people believe, oh, he might really be God. But like we talked about last week, some people thought he was Elijah. Some people said maybe he's a prophet. Some people thought he was John the Baptist. There was a lot of different ideas floating around about who he might be. So one day Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain. Jesus loved mountains. A lot of stuff happened on mountains in the Bible, didn't it? So he took these three disciples up on a mountain, and something really cool happened there. Jesus' face began to change. His appearance began to change. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes were like light. That would be a little different, wouldn't it? And suddenly they realized he was not alone. Moses and Elijah appeared with him. Now, these guys have been dead for a long time. Okay, Jesus is glowing. There's Moses. There's Elijah. What is happening? Then they heard a voice from heaven, and it probably made them shake in their boots. They couldn't believe their eyes and their ears. They heard the voice of God say this, This is my son. I love him, and I'm pleased with him. Listen to what he has to say. Wow, that would have been an experience, right? To get to see Jesus and God speaking to Jesus. That is, oh man. So Peter, James, and John had no doubt who Jesus was after that. Jesus was God's son. Now later on, let me read you what Peter wrote. Um, pretty cool. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he said, For we did not, oh, let me skip down. We were eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred 
mountain. Now, a lot of people can guess about who Jesus might have been, but these guys saw with their own eyes and they heard with their own ears that Jesus was God's son. That is really cool, isn't it? They got to hear God's voice. Wow. So listen, today it's the same thing. People have a lot of ideas of who Jesus might be, but we know the truth. Where do we go when we're not sure about something, when we want to know the truth? Where do we go? We go to God, we can pray. We go to the Bible. Both good answers, yeah. We want to bathe our time in Scripture in prayer. And this is going to point us to what's right and what's wrong. And we know what this book says. It says that Jesus is really God's son. He was man to rescue us, but he was God's son. So let's worship Jesus Christ, the son of God, our savior, our Messiah, our king. We're going to worship him this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for eyewitness accounts. Thank you for the accuracy of the Bible. Thank you that we don't have to doubt, that we don't have to to wonder or rely on something shaky. God, we can stand on your word. It can hold up to any test. Lord, we love you. We thank you for rescuing us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Southside. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced a new praise song to you guys called Praise You Anywhere. That really is our, our goal as Christians, right? To make our lives a praise song to Him. We're so excited to be able to worship with you this morning, and we want to invite you to stand with us as we sing Praise You Anywhere.
Father. Thank you for uh, this wonderful church and what it means to us, and thank you for giving us the freedom to come here and worship you each and every week, and just especially let us be mindful of all the great things you've done for us our entire lives, especially sending your son Jesus to die on the cross, even knowing that we would be sinners before we were born. Just uh, thank you for your grace and your love, and help us to go out into the world and share that grace and love with the, with the lost in the world, and just Help us to be a witness each and every day of all that we do. And help us to give back as we come to this time to give our tithes and offerings and help us to do so with a free and open heart and know that uh, you can use those, that money and those seeds and things to go out and, and reach the lost in our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May be seated.
You may be seated. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in the year 2016, not too long ago, that Rio de Janeiro hosted the Olympic Games. It was the first time that uh, the Summer or Winter Olympic Games had, been, uh, had taken place in South America. And I tuned in and, and I watched with great interest because, well, uh, first of all, I, lo I love the Olympics. I've always loved the Olympics from the time I was a child. It was the uh, fulfillment of a dream to work in the heart of the Olympics in 1996 when they were hosted uh, in Atlanta. Always, always loved the Olympics. Every time I can, every time it comes on, I, I do want to see as much of it as possible. I think it's fantastic. But the second reason that I, I tuned in to the Rio games is because on network TV, every time they showed the city, which was often, day or night, every time they showed the city, there was Jesus. There was Jesus. You cannot show Rio without showing Jesus. So I could turn on the TV and I could say, yes, there is my Lord and Savior. This 98-foot-high statue, Christ the Redeemer, is not the tallest statue of Jesus in the world. A Google search tells me it is the 10th tallest statue of Jesus in the world. However, because of where it's situated, high up on that mountain overlooking the city, it appears to be the tallest statue of Jesus in the world. It's considered one of the new seven wonders of the world. And so that made me curious. I, I wonder how many people in Rio who have sat in the shadow of Jesus since 1931 I wonder how many of these citizens are Christian believers. Survey says 64% identify as Catholic, 22% as Protestant, 5% as other, and 8% as non-religious. I wonder what it would be like to be part of that 13% growing up in Rio in the shadow of Jesus who don't believe in him. Every time they step out their door, there he is, there he is, towering high above them. I grew up in the shadow of Jesus. He cast a long shadow in my house. My Christian parents took me to church and Sunday school every week. I, I don't ever remember objecting. It was just part of of what we did. It was part of life. And I liked church, and I liked the kind people there, and I was always learning. I, I thought the church was fun. It was a good place, and, and God was there. Though I was saved at a very young age, between my 10th and 11th grade years in, in school, I determined to own my own faith and not rest on the faith of my parents. I wanted answers to the questions that were not being addressed in Sunday school, so uh, I began to do a lot of reading and investigation on my own, and I don't remember telling my parents that I was doing this because in my mind, that would have been counterproductive, okay? See, this was, this was for me. This was about me being independent. This was about me owning my own faith, and if I had told them what I was doing, they might have wanted to be helpful, and I didn't want that at all. I wanted this to be my investigation. This is about me and Jesus. Was he who he said he was, and what did that mean for me now? So between the Bible I was reading and, and all of the numerous Christian books that lined the bookshelves in my home, and there were many, and some were scholarly, it was very easy to determine, and you saw this last week, that Jesus was a historical figure. His moral character was confirmed, and his miracles were verified, and these things are basically indisputable, 
I mean, they, these, are, these are the facts of history. The evidence was overwhelming. I, I, okay, I, I mean, I guess people can argue about anything. You know, some people just love to, to argue. You watch an intentional foul committed at the end of a football game, and if the refs don't throw the flag, both sides are going to argue forever on their own team's behalf, even with video evidence. I, I get that. I get that. But someone who is impartial, who is willing to consider the evidence when it comes to the identity of Christ, will acknowledge that these things are true. These are clear. These are foundational. The next step, however, is tricky. If you ask Siri, who is Jesus? You get the answer, he was a first century Jewish preacher and religious leader. Preacher and religious leader. If you try to do research online asking the same question, you're going to get pages and pages of contradictory information and even people fighting online, if you can imagine that, that happens, <laughs> fighting over the identity of Jesus Christ. Not helpful. In fact, just this week, as I was studying for this message, I came across a new theory about Jesus. I mean, there's not a lot that surprises me. This one did. That somebody has suggested that Jesus got his supernatural insight by living in India for a while. <laughs> yeah, apparently uh, it, it goes, the theory goes, he became an Eastern guru, and he came back with special knowledge. The obvious problem with this theory is that Christ was an expert in Judaism, not Indian wisdom. Everything that Christ taught came from the Hebrew Scriptures. He was the Jewish Messiah. The Jewish people knew him. He had lived among them for most of his life. If Christ had traveled to India and became an Eastern guru, he was a worthless guru because apparently he retained none of the teaching and taught no Indian wisdom at all, okay? So, so this theory is ludicrous to me. But reading that, reading that proved to me once again that there are some people who will grasp at straws to avoid the plain, simple, obvious truth. How do we know the truth about Jesus? What would you do if someone moved into the vacant house next door to yours? What would you do if you wanted to get to know them? Would you do an internet search? Would you ask other neighbors if they had met them? Would you stalk them on Facebook? <laughs> There's an honest choir member. <laughs> if you really wanted to get to know them, probably the best thing you could do is take your feet, move them next door, knock on the door, ring the doorbell, and introduce yourself, yes? That is the, the most obvious way, the old-fashioned way, the old-school way. Hey, I'm so-and-so. Who are you? What do you do for a living? Tell me about your kids. You say that seems really old-fashioned. It works. It works. What did Jesus say about himself? Uh, no, listen, I didn't, I didn't ask what do other people say about him. What did Jesus say about himself? Brings us to our outline this morning. And here's where I say things get tricky. Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be God. At funerals, a Bible verse that I share most of the time is a quote from Jesus at his Last Supper with his disciples. He he said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is bold. He's saying, listen, if you want to find God, you go through me. He's the Father. I am the Son. We are one and the same. And in that same chapter, he pushes it even further when he says, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father also. Jesus claimed to be God. It wasn't just to his closest allies that he said this. Leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus was taken to trial before Caiaphas, the high priest. 
Many people we read brought false testimony against Jesus. He was silent. And then we read in Mark's gospel, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. He says directly, I am. Am, and then he uses this title, Son of Man, and everybody there knew exactly what he was referring to. Daniel chapter 7, about that heavenly one who will rule forever. Caiaphas, all those listening, they recognized in a second, in a second what he was saying. They condemned him worthy of death because of blasphemy. You are claiming to be God. Last week, you are reminded that Jesus is respected worldwide, even among people of other religions. He's considered a great teacher. He's considered a prophet in many world religions. C.S. Lewis pounced on this watered-down perspective in his book, Mere Christianity. Here are his words. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or he, else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. This is that uh, Lord, liar, or lunatic argument. He, either he was lying about himself and, and deceiving people, he was a lunatic, he was delusional, or the other option is he's exactly who he said he was, and he claimed to be God. What do you do with that? Story goes that Muhammad Ali, three-time boxing heavyweight champion, was about to take off on a commercial airline flight. Flight attendant told Ali to fasten his seatbelt. Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Flight attendant said, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> Jesus claimed to be God. Listen, and, and maybe you've lost this along the way. That's not normal behavior. That's not normal human behavior. Could he back up his claim? Other people heard the Father affirm the Son. It went on record and was never disputed by his followers that they heard God's voice from heaven affirm his Son at least twice. First, it is baptism. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You know, if you're in such a situation and you and many other people hear a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, what conclusion might you come to? That's his son. You heard it with your own ears. You can even turn to the person next to you and say, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Everybody heard it. Many eye eyewitnesses, ear witnesses, is that a thing? <laughs> then at the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and, and Cameron mentioned this one earlier, fewer eyewitnesses, only three, but again, the experience left quite an impression on them. 
While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. At least twice, God identifies Jesus as his son, his only son. It's no wonder then. Next point, Jesus' disciples believed his claim. They believed it. They believed what he said. If you take just the book of Mark, for example, you run through the first eight chapters. They are full of Jesus serving and healing and teaching and casting out demons, calming a storm, raising a little girl from the dead, feeding 5,000 people while he's explaining to everybody about the kingdom of God and eternal life. And the key to understanding his ministry in the Gospel of Mark, fantastic word, appears 12 times in his Gospel. It's the word immediately. Immediately this happened. Immediately he did this. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. We get the impression as we move through, there were no down days. That during his whole ministry, it was from one thing to another. Immediately, 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 immediately. There was no one or two week vacations. How many times that he got alone with the Father? But the disciples, I mean, they must have felt like they were in a whirlwind. Constantly, things were happening. Things were being done they had never seen before in their lives. No wonder they believed that Jesus was a God. You don't have to rest on today's evidence. Just take yesterday or the day before. At one point, Jesus pulled his disciples aside, asked them who others said he was, and they threw out these, these possibilities, things that other people were saying. But Matthew 16, 15, what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Peter knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew about the prophecies. He knew about what Isaiah had predicted. He knew who to look for, what to look for, and, and living alongside Jesus and, and walking with him day after day, listening, watching, not just one miracle, but every day. Impossible things happening. The blind made to see, the lame healed, the dead raised. You know, this isn't a huge leap of faith to say, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I, I can't think of one more thing to ask you to do to prove it. Every day. And they all got there eventually to that point of faith, even doubting Thomas. Jesus was sinless. His miracles went unchallenged. But his claim to be God, now that's something that his enemies could not let go. Jesus' enemies killed him. They killed him because of his claim. At one point during his public ministry, the crowds asked him directly if he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus answered them plainly and added, I and the Father are one. And then we read, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works for my Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. I'll say it again. Claiming to be God is not normal human behavior. Sane people... Ordinary people don't do this. Everybody understood that this claim crossed the line. John 19, 7, the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Okay, I'm going to test you here. This, this, this test is open book, okay? Okay. And when I say open book, I'm talking about the book. I'm going to test you here. Are you ready? Ready? Ready. Why, does it, why did his enemies kill him? Why? 
Why did his enemies kill him? Because he claimed to be this is why. This was the crucial issue. And incidentally, we also read several times that the demons who possessed people recognized Jesus to be who he said he was. So that brings us to the million dollar question, what do you do with the man who claimed to be God? What do you do? From Pew Research Center, September 2022, only a few decades ago, if you were an American, you were a Christian. As recently as the early 1990s, about 90% of U.S. adults identified as Christians, but today about two-thirds of adults are Christians, 63% today. From, from 90% in 1990 to 63% today, that's a huge drop-off in a relatively short period of time. The change in America's religious composition is mainly the result of large numbers of adults leaving the Christian religion in which they were raised to become religiously unaffiliated. In other words, over the past 30 years, people who were raised in church have been leaving the church in record numbers. Does this bother you? Bothers me. Gallup poll, 2021. U.S. church membership was 70% or higher from 1937 through 1976, falling modestly to an average of 68% in the 1970s through the 1990s. The past 20 years have seen an acceleration in the drop-off with a 20 percentage point decline since 1999. The decline in church membership is consistent with declining church attendance and an increasing proportion of Americans with no religious preference. On average, 69% of U.S. adults were members of a church in the year 2000 compared to 52% today. Again, that's a pretty significant drop-off. Many people who were raised in church over the past three decades have left. And not only left church, but actually left their Christian faith behind. That makes me feel like I live in Old Testament Israel, three generations after the Exodus, when despite all that God had done in miracles and in power, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I feel like there's got to be a breakdown somewhere. Parents, culture, the church. I don't know exactly what it is, but it bothers me, and not because of my profession, but because those numbers represent millions of Americans who have abandoned the faith. If you know if you know, if you have it nailed down that Jesus was a historical figure, his moral character was confirmed, his miracles were verified, he claimed to be God, other people heard the Father affirm the Son, his own disciples believed his claim, and his enemies killed him for his claim. Well, that, that puts you at a point of decision, and that point for me made it impossible for me to ever walk away. From Jesus. When Jesus was walking around on this earth, and he told his followers at one point that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to remain in him, to abide in him. We read that some of his listeners were disgusted. John chapter 6. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter's like, no way I'm going to let go. No way I'm going to walk away. Let me remind you of one thing, by the way, in context. This 
is before the cross and the resurrection. This is before they saw him crucified and rise from the dead. Even then, Peter had enough proof to hold on to his belief while others fell away. And so do I. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the record that we have of the life, the death, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the claim. We thank you for the evidence. We thank you for the one who was willing to give all so that we could be reconciled to you forever. We thank you for the blood, for the perfect spotless lamb, for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We thank you this morning, Lord. You are worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of of commitment, our time of invitation, this is your time to respond to God as he leads you. As always, to pray for people who might be on your heart this morning, and perhaps God is even leading you to pray for somebody you know who who was part of of this church or a church, and and, and they have strayed so far, and even this morning your heart is breaking for them. I can't think of a better thing to do during this invitation time than to lift them up to the Lord in prayer. He would call them back into the fold. This is your time. Let's stand together as we sing and worship our great God and Savior. Let's stand.
Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for being awesome. Thank you for being God. Thank you for this family of believers, and thank you for your word that testifies so clearly to who you are. If anyone has not come to grips with that reality, Lord, we ask that you get them there today, and that each moment of our lives we spend it sharing you with those around us. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you.